Thank you, Austin. Um, so I'm going to start off with a quick trail description, and then I'm going to talk a bit more in detail about some of the things that you should consider when you're figuring out how long to make your days and when you're looking at your itinerary. Um, so first of all, the GDT is about 1,100 kilometers, which is about 680 miles, um, and it runs between Waterton on the US border and there's three potential um, endpoints in the north or start points if you want to go south. Um, so traditionally through hikers, start or finish at Jasper, Mount Robson or Kakwa, but really there's a couple of other options along there too. Um, most people do go northbound. The trail varies from great, really easy hiking in national parks um, to no trail at all in some, especially in alpine areas. Um, and there's also quite a, a good amount of bushwhacking, um, especially in alders. Um, the GDT features multiple alternates with various levels of difficulty. Um, it is a little bit different from other trails if anybody here has through hike something else, um, because you do need an individual permit for every single campsite that you stay in, in a bunch of different locations. So multiple different national parks, um, and then also some provincial parks as well. Um, especially the really popular spots in um, Banff and Jasper National Parks can book within seconds on opening day. So it's great that you're here and planning ahead um, because it's a very difficult trail to book campsites for last minute. Um, it, the GDT is an absolutely gorgeous trail. It's stunningly beautiful. It's my favorite trail that I've hiked. Um, you get great views every single day. And I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that it's some of the best hiking in the world. So if you, if you kind of leave this thinking, oh, that's a lot of permits to get, it's absolutely worth it. Um, so in terms of difficulty, um, the GDT distance is pretty deceptive. Um, it's a relatively short through hike in comparison to the Triple Crown, but it crams a lot of difficulty into a relatively short distance. Um, it's not a good hike for beginners. Um, plenty of people do it as a first through hike, um, but most people have a good amount of backpacking experience before they start. Um, it, is, it is much more challenging than a lot of other trails, uh, mostly due to how remote it is. Um, the wildlife, there's a lot of challenging navigations and food carries can be quite difficult as well because they're quite long. Um, I'm not trying to scare people off, just mentally be prepared for a tougher trip than other hikes um, and expect to do lower daily mileage as a result of that. Um, when to hike, um, so it generally depends on the year. Um, late June to mid-September is kind of a normal hiking season. Um, if you start earlier or um, towards the beginning of that window, you can expect more snow early in your hike and also higher river crossings. Um, a later start can mean that you might get early snowstorms, um, like winter coming early, and then there's also a higher potential for fire closures as well. Um, last year, we got a snowstorm in mid-August, so you can pretty much expect the unexpected at any time in terms of weather. Um, another challenge that's um, pretty common on the GDT is there is a lot of wildlife, um, especially bears. Um, we saw seven bears on our through hike, um, so make sure you bring some bear spray um, and buy it on once you're on the trail rather than trying to fly with it. And then also make sure you have a safe way to store your food too. Um, most people had ursacs. I did see some people with bear canisters as well. Um, and you are going to want to make sure that all of your food for your longest section fits into whatever you're using for food storage before you start. Um, and if it doesn't, either buy a bigger ursac or bring two or whatever you need to do to make it fit and be safe. Okay, so that's a general overview. Um, some things to consider. Um, when you're planning your days and trying to decide how many kilometers you want to hike every day and how to make your itinerary. Um, first of all, the terrain that the GDT covers varies incredibly. Um, some days you have nice, flat, easy road walks where it's not a challenge at all. Um, and then most of the trails and national parks are really nice as well. And then it varies from that to straight up and down, super steep climbs, sometimes on scree. Um, occasionally there's no trail at all and no indication of which direction you're supposed to go. And then also um, the famous bushwhacking too. Um, this makes it kind of hard to tell how long days should be um, because especially if you're looking at your map and your elevation profile, it doesn't always reflect the terrain that you're getting into. Um, so make sure you do your research before you book your sites to figure out challenging sections that are going to slow you down. 
Um, we had some problems with some avalanche debris, which is obviously not on a map, um, and it can take 20 minutes to get around um, for just a couple of hundred meters. So Charlene is going to talk some more about some of these spots, so make sure you listen closely when she mentions them. Um, and yeah, just make sure you do your research about what days are going to be slower. Um, it can also change quite quickly um, for either better or worse. Um, this year, a lot of bridges washed out, which can add time if you have to ford a river. Um, but then we also had the amazing experience of hiking through the jack pine and there was beautiful trail maintenance and what, would, what took people um, much longer, two days before we went through was suddenly fine. Um, so the GDTA has um, sample itineraries on their website and we'll talk a little bit more about those in a minute. Um, they do normally take the tougher sections into account, so if you see a really short day on there, it might be because it's a really challenging day. Um, another thing to consider with your itineraries is weather. Um, really anything is possible on the GDT, um, and I think we all experienced it last summer. Um, we had 40 degrees Celsius heat, and then we had snowstorms. Um, so really, you can expect anything at any time. Um, you can also find yourself waiting at thunderstorms, um, snowstorms, or anything else, or like wind, um, if it's too, too dangerous to go up a ridge. Um, so that might slow you down. Obviously, you can't predict the weather, especially not five, six months in advance. Um, so make sure when you're making your schedule, you have space in there to catch back up to your reservation. So either slower days or extra days in town. So if you get off schedule, you're, you can catch back up to your permits. Um, navigation is another issue that can affect how long you want to make your days. Um, it is improving every year. So thank you to the GDTA for that. Um, sections that involve heavy route finding, though, really cut into your daily mileage. Um, and if you're constantly looking for the correct route, that can really slow you down a lot. Um, we found that it was much more difficult to navigate north of Jasper. So just keep that in mind when you are making your itineraries. Um, another thing to think about is food. Um, resupplying on the GDT is much more difficult than other trails. Um, and how much food you can physically carry kind of influences how long you can make your sections. Um, personally, when I threw hikes last summer, my shortest food carry was six days and my longest ended up being 14 days, which is an insane amount of food. Um, you do have to mail boxes in a couple of locations. Um, Saskatchewan River Crossing is one place. Um, so if anybody is on the call from outside of Canada, um, make sure you plan a day or two once you get into the country um, to mail the boxes um, because you can't really do that from outside. Um, or one thing you could do that's pretty fun that I wish we'd done in hindsight is rent a car and do a road trip down the Ice Fields Parkway and drop all the boxes off yourself. Um, last year, COVID restrictions really affected what locations would take boxes, and I think it's going to be pretty similar this year too. So make sure you check um, where you can mail a box to. Um, and then also stay flexible and be prepared to potentially miss a resupply spot and carry more food. Um, this year we had an unexpected uh, closure where Mount Robson, um, the, the Berg Lake Trail was closed. So nobody could get out on the last section um, there. And that's a very common through hiker resupply. Um, so even though you're mailing boxes, be prepared to be flexible. Um, most resupply locations are pretty much on the trail. But if you do have to hitch anywhere, um, make sure you factor in that extra time into your itinerary. Um, and then also make sure when you're planning your days that you can make it to a resupply location before they close. So if you have a really long day and you're showing up super late at night, uh, the store that you're, or the post office that you're planning on picking up at might be closed. Um, so try and avoid that. Um, another point to keep in mind, uh, the GDT is a lot more remote than most other trails. Um, so it's really difficult to bail to town if you run out of food or get off of your schedule. Um, you really don't cross too many roads and most of the side trails that you take to highways can be well over a day's walk, um, especially in the north. Um, there's very limited cell service to check weather or coordinate rides. Um, so most hikers do bring in an inreach, um, which is extra important if you're getting the shuttle at Kakwa um, or if somebody is meeting you with a resupply box somewhere. Um, another thing when you're making your itineraries, make sure you um, 
book your town accommodation pretty much right after you book um, your campsite permits. Um, they fill up pretty quickly and it can be difficult to find cheap places to stay. Um, Banff and Jasper in particular, world, world renowned tourist destinations. So um, they can be very difficult to find somewhere cheap to stay um, on short notice. Um, also, if you can, uh, try and add in extra days in town. Um, the town can be expensive, so that's a little bit difficult to do, um, but it really helps if you get off schedule um, because then you just have, you just miss one of your zeros in town. Um, yeah, so the GDT, as I've said, um, it's a very difficult trail. Um, and we got to Jasper and we were just exhausted. Um, and so sticking to your itinerary and having to like all these permits that you have to follow um, means you can't really just take an extra day off if you show up somewhere and you're like, I'm, I'm tired, I want an extra zero. Um, so it's a good idea to try and keep as many double zeros or even more um, time off in there if you can. Um, if when I hike the GDT again, I'm definitely gonna make sure I have a lot more zeros in there. Um, so taking all of these factors into account, um, the daily distance that you can cover on the GDT is a lot less than what you can cover on different trails. Um, out of the trails that um, people are probably most familiar with, the best comparison is the Continental Divide Trail. Um, but I would say that the GDT is probably two or three times harder depending on the year. Um, I was able to do 30, over 30 miles a day on the CDT pretty easily, um, but found 30 kilometer days on the GDT pretty difficult. Um, I think the best example is when we did La Colette Ridge, um, which I think Charlene's gonna talk about more. Um, we did a 14 kilometer day and it literally took all day, which is the lowest mileage I've ever done on any trail. Um, so if anybody here normally hikes in miles, um, the easiest way to think about it is just to keep all of your distances in, mile, like in your mind, look at the kilometers and just imagine it's miles. Cause yeah, it's, it's a much more challenging trail to do high mileage on. Um, so yeah, don't be, don't be cocky about your mileage, just kind of plan shorter days. Um, it's really difficult to adjust your schedule once you're on trail. Um, so just try and plan for, for shorter days. Um, so Austin's going to talk about the GDTA spreadsheets a little bit more, um, but these are going to be your best friend when you're planning. Um, they're all on the GDTA website, and if you haven't looked at those already, you definitely should. Um, there's three different itinerary speeds. Um, there's relaxed, which is 69 days, average, which is 50 days, and fast, which is 36 days. Um, so straight off the bat, fast is super humanly fast. Um, most people do not do that one. Um, and then relaxed, even though it's relaxed, can still often involve full like 12 plus hour days of hiking, just because the trail is challenging. Um, so when you're looking at those um, itineraries, keep that in mind. Um, you do have to balance how far you're willing to hike each day with how much food you can carry, um, since there are limited resupply points, which can make the relaxed schedule slightly more challenging. Um, personally, we followed the average schedule and we still had a couple of 15 hour days when we were starting at sunrise and hiking till 9.30 at night and we're pretty experienced hikers. Um, I would suggest following average if you've through hiked before and then relaxed if you want slightly easier days and just don't, maybe don't do fast. Um, one final point that I'm gonna talk about um, and that is the bubble on the GDT. Um, so the GDT is not really a social trail like some of the other long distance trails are. Um, you just don't meet other hikers. There's just not that many of us out there. Um, there's a little bit of a bubble that starts early July, um, normally around July 1st, um, or if there's a weekend around that date. Um, there's still only a couple of hikers. It's not, not crazy. Um, if you start a little bit later or if you go southbound, you're really not going to see very many people at all, which is great if you want some solitude. Um, one thing, if you do decide that you want to start around that July 1st bubble, um, it does make getting some permits more difficult. Um, some places like Six Passes and the Maline uh, River Valley um, only issues a permit a day. So not only are you competing with any tourists that want to do that or local hikers that want to do that, you're also competing with other through hikers around you. 
Um, so just keep that in mind. Um, it also might be a little bit harder to find places in town. Um, some places like Safe Haven and Coleman only take a couple of hikers. And then same with shuttles to Waterton or out of Kakwa, because um, there's very limited resources around the trail. Um, so just keep that in mind if you do decide to start around those days that it might make some of the logistics harder as well. So. Awesome. Thanks, Eloise. Thanks. Um, now we're going to kind of pivot a little bit and Charlene's going to chat a little bit about um, different sections, how they compare and kind of some days you might want to watch out for on uh, each section. Yeah, okay. Um, so every section is outstanding in its own way, but I'm mostly going to cover the factors that may affect your planning. So harder days, easier days, and alternates. So for Section A, um, Section A is a bit of everything, the well-maintained world-class trails of Waterton, uh, some rougher challenging terrain, and some road walking. You can random camp for free after you leave Waterton Park at kilometer 54. So your hardest stay on Section A will be La Culotte Ridge. Um, there are five climbs and descents along the ridge, some of them pretty steep, um, which takes most people, most of the day, as Fonsai says. I mean, it's best to camp as close as possible to the start of the ridge at Jutland Creek or Scarp Pass. I camped at Scarp for the first time last year and I quite liked it. It's um, less soggy than Jutland and you have um, a nice view of the ridge so you can pick your line up to it the next day because there's no trail. Uh, there's also uh, the Barnaby Ridge alternate. I haven't done Barnaby, but um, from what I understand, it um, adds time and difficulty. Lots has been said about it in the GDT Hikers Facebook group, so you can check out the discussion and videos there. Also, keep in mind that Luck Lot is one of the few places on the main route where you'll have to be mindful of how much water you're carrying, and that applies uh, to Barnaby as well. For an easy day, there's some easy ATV track and road walking into Coleman, but in general, once you've finished La Culotte or Barnaby, um, there is considerably less climbing for the rest of the section than you've done up to that point. Section B, Coleman to Kananaskis. So you can complete this whole section without making any reservations or paying any fees. The heart of the original GDT is in section B, uh, where you'll be following orange blazes. And it's mostly good quality trail. And section B has the second most elevation gain of all of the sections. For a hard day, uh, section B also has the steepest climb of the trail at Tornado Saddle. It's not too long, but it's up a super steep scree slope. And there's also um, the avalanche debris that Funsize mentioned leading up to that, um, that can be a little slow going. Finally, on my third time through there, I found a pretty decent, uh, efficient route. Um, so you can ask me about that later if you like. Um, for an easy day, near the end of the section, there's a 30 kilometer walk along the Elk River Road. It's quite a scenic um, back road with not too much traffic, so it's not too bad. Um, there is an alternate Coral Pass, which avoids the road but it will add um, time and a significant crossing of the Elk River. Section C, Kananaskis to Field. Um, section C passes through the most national parks and provincial parks of any section. 95% of it is on excellent trail. You'll have bridges, signage, and designated backcountry campgrounds. There is no obvious hardest, hardest day in this section. It will likely depend on your distance. Uh, you'll be climbing 12 passes in the 200 kilometers and um, just be prepared for snow travel on those passes if you're there before early July. Um, an easy day, once you've climbed the last pass, good surpass, it's mostly downhill or flat uh, 30 plus K into field. Um, there's an alternate, uh, Northover Ridge. It's a gorgeous ridge walk with one narrow exposed section. As with, with most alternates, it will add some time. And this is uh, best done in good weather as you'll be above a tree line. I've done Northover, um, but never part is my, of my through hikes. Um, if you want to take in the very best scenery, then go for it. But the main route is um, very nice here as well. 
Section D, field to Saskatchewan River crossing. Uh, Section D used to get a bad rap, but with the addition of uh, key bridges and new alternates, it is much improved. You'll see a lot fewer people than you did on C, and it is mostly random camping. Expect some good trail, off trail hiking, and wet feet. Now, every section of the GDT has unbridged uh, river cross at creek crossings, but as you're splashing uh, through the channels along the Howes River floodplain, just be aware of where you are in relation to the main channel. It's a big river and some people have had to backtrack or do a super sketchy crossing uh, to get back on the right side. Uh, for hard day, uh, if you take the main route, uh, you'll run into some deadfall and seriously overgrown trail along the Emisqui River. Um, it's a bit silly, it's not ideal, but it is uh, very doable. I would recommend the Quetanoc alternate um, that avoids that um, section I just, just described. It takes advantage of um, some excellent trails in Yoho National Park. Um, things do get rougher when you drop down from Quetanoc Pass through a sizable boulder field. If you're like me and find it challenging to leap from boulder to boulder with a heavy pack on, um, this will be slow going. Um, from there, you climb up to Quetanoc Gap and drop down through a well-flagged route uh, back to the main trail. If you plan to hike from field to where uh, random camping is allowed, that would be um, strenuous 33 kilometers, but there are campgrounds uh, you can book along the way. Uh, for D, there is no obvious easiest day. There are only two gentle passes on the main route. The alternates will add some climbing, but overall this section doesn't have as much elevation gain as the others. There are two alternates. Um, that you can take to avoid walking on a logging road. Uh, that's uh, Emisqui Ridge and Collie Creek alternates. Section E, the crossing to Jasper. Section E um, is a section of contrast, uh, rough and remote and well-maintained and popular. Random camping is allowed for the first part until you enter Jasper National Park. The hard day I'm gonna give to uh, the Owen Creek Trail near the start of the section. You're climbing more than a thousand meters along a rough trail that sometimes climbs steeply away from the creek. How often you have to climb away from the creek depends um, partially on when you're there. If you're there first of July, it'll be a lot. And if you're there in August, it won't be much of a factor, but it is a rough trail and slow going. An easy day um, would be any day on the excellent trail in the Brazo area and skyline. Section F, Jasper to Robson. North of Jasper is where the weather gets cooler and wetter and the trail gets muddier. It's good to have your rain gear dialed in and your warm layers. Um, last year, I swapped out my down puffy for a synthetic one uh, for this last bit and I, I wore it a lot hiking. I was glad I did. Section F has mostly easy to follow trail but soggy in some parts of it and random camping is allowed. For a hard day, uh, the Colonel Creek Trail on the way down to the Moose River passes through a burn area that can have quite a bit of deadfall. There has been maintenance over the years, but not particularly often. Um, so maybe you'll be lucky and this will be the year. Uh, for an easy day, the section starts with a 20 uh, kilometer highway walk out of Jasper. Now, if you're carrying all of your food for sections F and G, this may not feel so easy. I prefer to do this separately if possible um, to save my joints. Um, some people do the road walk and um, then hitch back to Jasper for the night and hitch out to the trailhead the next day. Section G, Robson to Kakwa. Section G puts the wild and the wildest through hike. It's remote with only one viable bailout point. Um, the trail is good in places but wet, muddy, boggy, overgrown, disappearing, or non-existent in others. I find this section can be as tough mentally as it is physically in challenging weather. And the vast majority of the section is random camping. For hard days, I'm gonna identify um, three. There's um, 10 kilometers of alpine walking between Jack Pine Pass and Blueberry Lake. It's gorgeous, but there's no trail. So it can be slow going, especially if you have uh, reduced visibility. And secondly is the Jack Pine River, vastly, vastly improved uh, with the trail maintenance last year, but there's still a little bit more to do. 
So if you hit it before they finish up this year, um, expect overgrown and disappearing trail. And thirdly, there are numerous potentially challenging creek crossings in this section, uh, which may cause you to camp earlier than you've planned if you have to wait out the high water. For an easy day, um, if you don't have a ride out from the Bastille Trailhead, uh, the Walker Creek Forest Service Road is fast walking. When I did it, I'd never hiked 40K plus at once before, and I wouldn't have thought it possible, but um, with all the fitness you've gained by then, it is um, quite manageable. For alternate, alternates, um, the best reviews go to the Surprise Pass alternate. I considered doing it last year, but didn't because of the weather, which is a very common theme for Section G. There are other high route alternates, such as Perseverance. Um, search the um, um, GT Hikers Facebook group for first-hand accounts. All our alternates will add time and involve off-trail travel. Well, that's it for me. Austin will now tell you everything you need to know about making your schedule, reserving your campgrounds, and more. Awesome. awesome. Thanks, Charlene. Um, so yeah, I get to talk about the probably least exciting part of the Great Divide Trail, which is getting your campground reservations. Um, just kind of before I get into that in particular, I just wanted to mention some of the great resources on the GDTA website. So I'm just going to share my screen real quick and I will show you what I'm talking about. So here on the Great Divide Trail website, um, if you go to trip planning resources, there's a couple opt awesome things. So here's the itineraries that Eloise was talking about. Um, you can uh, it's an Excel file, you download it. Um, you can kind of see here, there's three kind of sheets on here that'll show you different sample itineraries. One thing I do want to mention though, is that a lot of people pick average and just stick directly to it. So kind of what I found worked best for our hike last year was to kind of look at this sheet here. And then if you go here and then go to campgrounds, this will give you a list of every, this again is a PDF. It's a list of every campground on the GDT. There are two extras that are getting added in F and G that aren't on the sheet yet, but they'll be in the far out or gut hooks app um, pretty soon. So once you kind of look at that itinerary, um, Dan Durston put those together. Um, big thanks to him for that. Um, and he really took kind of elevation gain into account, the terrain. So if you can compare it with, um, these campgrounds so maybe have a few backup plans just when you're when you're booking that because a lot of people are just going to look right at the, the average pace and then go with those so there's so many instances where you might only have to go 1k further or 1k shorter and it might not be kind of one of the one of the main sites um oh additionally on uh the great divide trail website um there are some awesome topographical maps um if you go that same tab that I just showed, there's one for maps. The Ryan Silks maps are awesome. I highly suggest everybody gets them printed out. Um, just wanted to mention though, that um, they don't have alter alternates on them. So just one thing to keep in mind, um, if you are going to be taking a alternate, um, make sure to draw it on there. Uh, what I did is I just kind of penciled it in there. Um, it doesn't have to be exact. I'm sure everybody here is going to have an electronic copy uh, on GPS or a watch or an inReach or something, but it is good to have a, an idea, um, especially, I'm not sure if we'll have it updated by them, but the High Rock Trail is now going to be the official GDT as of this year. So that's one thing to kind of keep in mind. Also getting those printed out, um, I found this out. Um, make sure to get it printed on a laser printer. So I went to Staples. It was like 80 bucks for the whole set, double-sided. And then I just had like each section in my resupply boxes. Um, if you get it printed on a laser printer, it won't run if it gets wet. So if it gets rained on, the paper might get weird and wiggly, but the ink isn't going to spill everywhere. So you can still use it even if it does happen to get wet. Um, so yeah, reservations in particular. Um, I'm not sure if people heard or experienced it last year, but it was a complete gong show last year where pretty much every backcountry site in Canada, as far as I know, was released on basically the same day. So for a lot of people, this meant um, that the system was crashing. Um, for myself, it took well over eight hours to kind of get all my sites booked. But this year they've kind of changed things and there's certain parks with certain days. 
So can it, if you're going to be doing a full through hike or at least doing section A, um, on January 25th at 8 a.m. Mountain Time, the Waterton town site, um, backcountry or Waterton sites are going to be released. Um, all this information is on the uh, Great Divide Trail website under the trip planning resources. Um, but yeah, January 25th at 8 a.m. Um, pretty much everybody I know took kind of like a zero in Waterton for the start. So kind of they booked one site at kind of the town campground there. Um, they kind of did a quick little slack pack down to the border and back, which I can't remember how many kilometers it is. It's not super far, um, just down and back. And then kind of the next day they left. So um, two nights there. Um, and yeah, it's a great way, like if you're trying to be in the bubble, it's a great way to meet people. I met one, two, three, like three or four people that I hiked a majority of the trail with right there in the, in the town campground, which was awesome. Basically just look for the people that don't have a car and have the smallest tent and there's a chance they're probably a through hiker. Um, on January 28th at 8 a.m. Mountain Time, uh, Banff, Kootenai and Yoho Parks are opening up. So that's gonna be pretty much all of section C. Um, and section the if you take the Kuitenok alternate, that's also gonna be the beginning of section D. Um, and then Finally, February 2nd is when Jasper opens up. So that's gonna be section E um, and a little bit on F. Usually you won't have to worry about booking things right away for section F. Um, it's quite often that Jasper won't let you book the, um, they won't let you book, um, where is it? The Moose River Campground because they say it's flooded all the times. Uh, they, J Jasper Parks doesn't really go out on that section very often. so they aren't really always aware of what the trail is like. So um, you might have to wait to book those until maybe a, even when you're in Jasper on your zero, you can book them or right before you start the trail, you can usually book them. Um, for all the Parks Canada systems, if the system's crashing or taking a really long time, you can call the park directly. Um, this past summer, this was how I got almost all of my parks bookings. Um, I found that calling the Lake Louise office worked the best because they aren't getting just completely bogged down with calls like some of the big parks like Banff and Kootenai and Yoho. Lake Louise park office can book reservations for you in Banff, Kootenai and Yoho parks. For Jasper, you have to call Jasper in particular. And um, I called and left a voicemail and I actually got a call back pretty quickly. Um, I did not think that was going to happen, but um, I was surprised. They do return your call in the order that they receive it. And for some of the alternates, like the six passes alternate in section E, the only way to get that pass is to call the parks office directly in Jasper. Um, there are a couple other provincial parks that you'll be going through. Um, Elk Lakes Provincial Park, um, that's, um, some people stay there, some people don't. That's coming into Bolton Creek there um, at the end of section B. Um, Peter Lohe Provincial Park. So that's where most people take their zero in between section B and section C. So Bolton Creek is the um, main campground there. Um, major tip, get a powered site. Um, the amount of hours that I spent sitting in front of the little store at the Bolton Creek Trading Post, charging my phone, my battery bank, and my camera. I mean, it didn't feel like a zero because I was sitting in front of a, uh, just on the ground in front of the store for like five or six hours. Um, it wasn't worth saving the 10 or 15 bucks. And the walk-in sites, even though they are cheaper, they are pretty far from the store. So highly suggest that if you are going to take a zero or if you are gonna stay at Bolton Creek for a rest day between section B and section C, um, look on the map and see where the, uh, look at the campground layout and then um, definitely get a powered site. I couldn't, couldn't suggest that one more. Um, it'd be a great way to meet other through hikers if that's what you're into too. Um, secondly, one of the biggest, one of the other parks that's going to be really hard to get a reservation um, is Assiniboine. That's a BC park. Um, they kind of have a two month rolling reservation. So two months to the day, it's released in the morning um, for the sites. That's uh, Magog and Og Lake. Um, if you aren't familiar with Assiniboine, there's a really beautiful hut is a bit of an understatement, but a huge lodge that um, a lot of people get hellied into. So high traffic, a lot of weekenders go there. It's 
spectacular, but um, high traffic. So if you are looking to stay at Magog, be on it right away at that um, two month rolling day. If you get kind of hosed on that, Og has significantly less people than Magog. Um, and you can avoid all of that by going to Porcupine. It can be a bit of a bigger day, so just kind of plan that out. But Porcupine, um, as far as I know, doesn't require a reservation at all. Um, and one thing I just want to show you, because I'm sure everybody's going to run into this problem, is that for Parks Canada, they aren't necessarily fully in tune with how long some through hikers are hiking per day. So there's a kind of a classic problem that comes up and I'm just gonna share my screen here. So here's the Parks Canada um, booking page. Just wanted to kind of do a quick walkthrough on here. So um, we'll go backcountry camping. Come on. All right, Parks Canada website. Let's try it again. All right, backcountry camping. And I'll just show you kind of one of the spots that it seems to happen the most. These aren't open yet, but it is a good idea to kind of go through and maybe just plan it out so you can kind of, when showtime happens, you're ready to go. So kind of one of the most um, common spots that you're gonna run into this is gonna be section C. And what happens is they don't necessarily think that you can complete the trip in given amount of daylight hours. And, but through hikers, you're not always hiking in the daylight. So for example, this section here, um, Ball Pass, this is on the GDT. And then you kind of come down here and cross. And this is where you start the rock wall trail. Um, a bunch of you have probably heard about that. It's a section on the GDT. It's probably one of the hardest spots to get reservations with Flow Lake being probably the hardest spot on the whole GDT to get a reservation. Um, for that reason, a lot of GDT hikers don't necessarily camp here just because it's so competitive. So to give you an idea on what a reservation would look like, if we say we're accessing the trail at Flow Lake, even though we might've started in Waterton with Parks Canada, you kind of have to pick a trailhead and book your campground um, for each park individually. So we'll say we're starting at the Flow Lake Trailhead. And by this point, you're probably feeling pretty strong and to avoid a lot of the problems. Um, say for example, I mean, this would be a massive day. I'm not suggesting that you do this, but I just wanna show you what happens sometimes if you try to book something that's too far. So if we're starting at Flow Lake and we wanted to go say all the way to Helmet Falls, so I'd say access site one, Helmet Falls. We get this warning. The route you've chosen is not possible in daylight hours. Um, this is going to be, it's pretty, con unless you're on the relaxed pace, you might not run into this, but for average and fast, um, it's likely that you will run into this problem at least once throughout the trip. Um, so like I said, if you call the park, they can get around this right away. Um, otherwise, a way to avoid it is you basically just have to manipulate the reservation a little bit just to make it work for you. So what that looks like is even though we sure we're starting here at Flow Lake, um, as Parks Canada doesn't think somebody can hike that far, what we have to do is just pick a closer trailhead to mitigate that problem. Um, I've kind of done a little bit of exploring and I think it's a 30K marker is where they say you can't hike that in a day. So if any days over 30K, uh, you'll be running into this problem. So instead of saying that we're gonna start here and go to Helmet Falls, if we just pick an arbitrary other trailhead like Paint Pots, we can get around that problem. So if we change this to Paint Pots, say Paint Pots, Helmet falls, boom. It's not open yet, but that's a good way to avoid it. Um, one frustrating thing is that um, other sections, so like in section C, for example, say you have Helmet Falls and then you also are staying at Ball Pass um, or Healy Creek or Egypt Lake. 
I think Egypt Lake is actually closed this year, but um, my point is that um, a lot of times that means you're gonna have to make a bunch of different reservations. You can't make one reservation that goes through your whole entire trip. Um, because of that problem, you have to kind of create several different bookings that are all linked together. Um, last year I did contact parks and said, hey, I have this trip. If you look, it's all consecutive, but um, with the Parks Canada booking system, there is a reservation fee of 10 to 12 bucks. Um, if you call them and show them your itinerary, if you email it to them, they will refund that. It is a little bit of work, but um, just to let you know that that is something that you can get around. Um, a couple of the campsites to look out for in particular, um, like I said, Low Lake, which is in Kootenai National Park, is probably the number one spot on the whole GDT um, with Magog Lake in Assiniboine Provincial Park, which is in BC. Um, some ways to avoid it. So Flow Lake is crazy tumbling, which is on the Rockwall Trail as well, right near that section, almost always has some spots. So if you can't make it happen, if you really want to stay at Flow, I totally get it. It's spectacular. But if you're, uh, if you didn't get that spot, you can almost always work your itinerary around so uh, you're in that tumbling. Um, some other really busy spots, if you're taking um, the Kowitnok alternate in section D, you're going to be going through the Ice Line Trail in Yoho, which is a really popular um, trail. There's two campgrounds that you can take that uh, stay on there, which are Yoho and Little Yoho. Um, they aren't as crazy as flow, but just to make sure that it, once these reservations do open up, it's not necessarily the most advantageous to go consecutively by your date. Sometimes it's better to just lock down those really hard to get campsites and then make everything else work. So if you get flow and then you get Yoho and then you can kind of figure it out. You might have some days where you're like, oh man, I really wanted to go only 30K. I have to go 36. That's just the nature of it, unfortunately. Um, we're really working with Parks Canada to see if we can come up with some solution like a through hiker permit. But at this point, there's no news on that. Um, one other section that will be quite busy is in Jasper National Park. Um, so there's, um, like Charlene said, the first half is pretty remote, random camp. There are campgrounds, but there's no uh, reservations needed for that. It's in the White Goat Wilderness. Um, you will end up on the Brazo Loop though, which is a really popular loop in Jasper that a lot of people will do over three, four or five days. Um, a couple of the really popular sites are going to be Boulder and Four Points. So this is section E. Um, you can get around having to reserve there, but um, just a lot of times it lines up pretty nicely if you um, stay in those particular spots. Um, also in Jasper, you will be on the um, Skyline Trail, which is incredibly popular. As far as I know, that's the most popular spot in all of Jasper National Park. Um, so Little Shovel, Snowball, and Takara are all really popular sites. There are a couple of spots that you can kind of get around that, like Watchtower. Um, that's where we ended up going. It was off trail a little bit, but the Skyline Trail is so good. People run it in a day all the time. So um, you'll be flying by the time you get there, especially with all the off trail travel in section E. Um, some updates for sections. Um, it does not look like Mount Robson or the Berg Lake Trail is gonna be open again this year. So something you might wanna plan ahead for your food carry, it will be big. Um, it will be, I mean, pretty much everybody's gonna have over a 10 day food carry in that section. Um, there is a company called Robson Valley Unplugged. They will offer some resupply sections. So, um, if you don't necessarily want to go the whole way to Kakwa, there are a couple places to kind of get out, which would be the Moose River or Blueberry. Um, this company, Robson Valley Unplugged, will also resupply you at Blueberry. It's kind of pricey. It's 500 bucks for 50 pounds. But if you broke that up between four people, that might be, um, people might be interested in that 125 bucks a person. And you split up a 12 to 14 day food carry into two like week long food carries. Um, this same company, Robson Valley Unplugged, will um, pick you up at the end of the trail. So kind of finishing section G, um, you'll end up at Kakwa Lake. There's a beautiful cabin there, which is as far as, in my opinion, it's the very best way to end a through hike. Um, 
From there, it's about a 30K hike to the trailhead. So you're not done once you get to the lake. Um, the GDT is over, but then there's a 30K hike to the trailhead where the parking lot is. Um, and then from there, it's about a 70, 70K hike out to the road. Um, you can drive it. Um, this past year, the road was not good. Um, we were in a lifted pickup. We were scraping. The truck needed a paint job by the end of it. Just kind of preface that it's um, your crossover SUV last year was 100% not going to make it. Um, it's a it's a pretty burly logging road. Um, they say I think three to four hours, and that's not um, that's people that kind of live in the bush. It takes them three or four hours, not three or four hours for um, somebody in like a, a RAV4. It's a it's a pretty burly logging road. Um, highly suggest contacting these people. They're super nice. They'll pick you up if you don't want to walk an extra 70K out, which might turn your food carry into two days longer. Um, it's a few hundred bucks, but you can split it with some friends. I do know that this year they're going to be switching up their program a bit and potentially only offering it a few days a week, but um, I haven't spoken to them since September, so things might have changed. So I would highly suggest that you give them uh, a shout if that's what you're interested in. Um, a couple things on resupplying um, in Coleman. So that's at the section A, Coleman, Alberta. Um, a couple of spots that through hikers have really liked would be the Safe Haven B&B. Um, they are trail angels. They're happy to help you, drive you to the grocery store, all that jazz. It's kind of the go-to spot. The name of the company was Robson Valley Unplugged. And they are on Facebook. Um, Safe Haven b, &B that's kind of the go-to uh, GDT zero spot in Coleman. Um, when I went through, they were full, so I ended up staying at Safe um, at the Paddock Inn, which is just a couple blocks away. They're also great. Um, they'll let you mail a resupply box there. I remember we just got in. I mean, it was my first through hike. We were tired. We got into Coleman, and it was right in the heat wave. It was like 40 degrees out, and they... Um, had our resupply boxes already in our room and they like pre put the AC on. It was great. I highly suggest staying at either of these places. Um, you can mail boxes to either of them. Or what I did is when I was getting a ride to Waterton, they let me drop off the box and they just hung on to it for the week it took me to hike there. Um, resupplying at the end of section B is to be determined right now. Um, we don't have an update on anything yet. There is a store there. Um, you are able to resupply from the store. It's like a small camp store, so it wouldn't be ideal. Like you're not going to get everything that you want, but it is 100% possible to fully resupply from, um, the Bolton Creek trading post. Um, additionally, that'll be the start of section C. So if you wanted to, um, about half the people I know went into Banff um, for a resupply. So on that section, you walk right by the Sunshine Ski Resort. Um, there is about a five or 6K hike off trail. That's just kind of a road. It's the access road to the ski hill that'll get you down to the main road in Banff. And then it's about 18K into town, but uh, most people just hitch into town. And then once you're in Banff, you can resupplied a real grocery store. Um, I know a lot of people that went there and just took a zero and kind of did BAMP touristy stuff. Um, moving on, once you'll be going at the end of section C, you'll hit the town of Field, BC. Um, field is pretty small, even by GDT standards. There's not a lot going on in field. There is a post office that you can send a general delivery box to. Um, I don't know anybody in particular that did that. Most people stay at the Truffle Pig, which is a restaurant and kind of B&B, &B, um, but most people I know hitched into Lake Louise. It's 26K. Um, there's a hostel there. Also with a decent restaurant, it's the cheapest place to eat in town. Um, and it's a hosteling international or a high hostel. So if you are going to stay at the hostel, um, I would suggest getting a membership. I can't remember how much they were, but I priced it out. And if you stay at the hostel in Lake Louise, and then also, if you're going to stay at the hostel in Jasper, which the same brand of hostel is there too, it'll definitely, you'll pay off the membership just between the four, maybe five nights. Like we double zeroed in Jasper and we zeroed in Lake Louise. So you'll easily pay that off. Um, in Lake Louise, you can send a general, general delivery box for your um, resupply box and they get a ton of them there. So they're super familiar with it. There's also a grocery store there. It is kind of expensive, but um it is nice. Um, 
the gear shops in Lake Louise, they will have like gas canisters and all that jazz, but um, some people swapped out shoes in this section and the gear store there is very kind of traditional backpacking boot heavy. Um, don't really expect any trail runners or anything like no ultras or any of the really popular kind of through hiking shoes in that town. Going on from section D, you'll uh, finish in Saskatchewan Crossing, which is the beginning of section E. Um, Again, they'll hold a box for you too. It's 25 bucks unless you stay there. Um, I would, if there was anywhere you're gonna send a resupply box, it should be here. The store at Saskatchewan Crossing is absolutely insanely expensive. One of the kind of classic gas canisters, the eight ounces. I mean, I bought them at a store here for like seven, eight bucks. There's 17 there. Um, I think a box of Pop-Tarts was like $12 or something. So just keep that in mind. Um, if you're gonna send a resupply box, maybe send snacks for your zero as well. It'll save you a ton of money. Um, we did end up zeroing there. Um, just heads up, there's no cell service. The Wi-Fi there was really bad. Um, like I could barely send an email. So social media, all that jazz, it's not gonna happen. Um, but yeah, it's a nice break because then uh, section E is kind of a, it's a harder section. Um, so yeah, highly suggest taking a zero there. Um, and then after that, you're gonna do section E and end up in Jasper. Um, there's a couple hostels there. Both of them will hold a resupply box for you um, or you can send it general delivery to the post office. Oh, one thing I should have mentioned about post offices is if you're gonna send a resupply box to any of them as general delivery, make sure you look at the days and hours that they're open. Um, in general, for the whole hike when I was planning out my itinerary. I just had my head down looking at dates, reservations, all that jazz. I did not pay attention to what days of the week I was going to be in places or what holidays there were. So I ended up going through Jasper National Park on the Skyline Trail August long weekend. Um, so maybe don't have your head down as much as I had. Look up and kind of put it in perspective on what days are going to be harder to get reservations like August long flow uh, August long trying to get a reservation at flow. It's a, that's a lottery chance pretty much. So, um, just kind of take that into account. Um, yeah. And then after Jasper, like I said, there's, um, you can get a resupply to blueberry Lake there. It's going to be 500 bucks. Otherwise it's going to be one big long food carry. Um, personally there's, it's about a 30 K road walk in the very beginning. I skipped that. Our friends took a cab. I think there was three people in the two, three people in the cab. It was like 50 bucks. Um, basically it saves you a day if that's what you're into. If you want to go for the true through, totally respect that. But um, it's going to be just one more day of food. Um, and besides that, that's kind of everything I had on our front. We can kind of go through some questions now. I saw there's a few in the chat box. I'm just going to kind of go through here and check back in. See if I missed anything. I think we're good there. Um, otherwise, if anybody has any questions, feel free to come off mute. Um, I think between the three of us, we're happy to answer pretty much any question you throw at us. Uh, thank you, do you hear me? Yep. Yeah, great presentations. Thank you by everyone. So if, if uh, my only question was, if I'm going from uh, Banff to Jasper, so I'm not doing the whole trail, is it better for us to go in June at the beginning of the season or better to go in September at the end of the season and I mean better in terms of getting access to campgrounds, permits, ease of getting those things. I would say June, you'll, you just, as far as access to campgrounds, you'll, June would be way easier, but you'll run into substantial amounts of snow. So where are the boots? Um, yeah, I mean, I was in trail runners the whole way, just so my feet could dry out um, the whole time. Um, September, I guess there won't be any snow on the trail, but it's likely that you'll have snow from the sky. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think also usually that kind of, I find the later half of June or second, the first half of July, things are just starting to ramp up and that might kind of be the best bet. How many days were you planning for? About uh, 30. 30? Yeah. I mean, I would just be really hesitant to start any earlier than like June 15th just because some of those passes can have a lot of snow on them. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. 
in the national parks, um, can you have uh, two people in one backcountry site? And if you can't, when you're making a reservation, can you book two different sites at once? Yeah, great question. Yeah, great question. Um, they're, they ask you for two things on the reservation page. They ask you for your party size, and then they ask you for your tent pad size. So um, you can have four people in one tent. It's just how many tent pads are you reserving? I'm not sure about the maximum amount of people allowed. I mean, most through hikers aren't gonna have a four or five person tent, um, but it is hard. Um, there was, it, it'd be hard to fit multiple tents on those pads. Um, unless say you're in a, a pair and you both have a really ultralight one person tent, you might be able to squeeze it on there. But um, in general, you're reserving mostly just the tent pad and then you pay per person. Thanks. Mm -hmm. I just see a question here in the chat from Mark. I've been told that section A is the hardest, but listening to the presentation, that doesn't sound true at all. Do you agree with this? Is B harder than A or about the same? Um, a has some really hard sections on it. Um, I think there's some really hard days on A, but overall, um, I I personally didn't find it the most challenging section. The day up La Coulette Ridge was one of the harder days. Um, but yeah, I think um, most people agree that like section F and G are the hardest. Um, Eloise, Charlene, what do you guys think on that? Um, I kind of think that there were, um, it was more specific days rather than sections that were challenging. So like La Coulette is, is, was probably the hardest part of the entire trail for me and that's in section A. Um, but then specific days were more challenging, I think, rather than like a section as a whole. So. For me, B was just a little bit deceiving because I didn't, um, you know, it doesn't have, you know, the, the biggest passes or whatnot, but there is just a lot of up, up and down, but nothing, nothing particularly tricky. Um, B is, B is good trail. Um, yeah, just tornado saddle, which is, like I said, very short. So they're, they're different. No section is easy. No section is uh, too hard. Yeah, I think there's a lot that can come into that too. Like, um, there can be a lot of factors. Physically hard doesn't always mean that it's the hardest. Like there's, um, like personally, I found maybe the hardest day was the second day on the six pass alternate in section E. Um, it's completely off trail and kind of going uphill through brush and stuff was very frustrating and slow. Or if it's raining or snowy or the bugs are really bad, a hard day doesn't have to necessarily mean that it's the most physically hard. And then is La Coulette worse than Northover? I think La Coulette is substantially harder than Northover. Um, Northover, there's really good trail pretty much the whole way. Um, La Coulette, I found, was a bit deceiving too. I thought it was just La Coulette Peak, but you go over several peaks. Um, La Coulette's just the only one that's kind of named. So it's not just one peak and then you're done. You're going to continue along that ridge line and hit several peaks the whole way along. And there's um, no shade like when we did it. I think we started at like 2.30 in the morning. Uh, this was in the heat wave where it was 40 degrees out, but there's no shade and there's no water. So there's a huge incentive to kind of get that over with before the heat of the day hits. Can reservations be made via phone or just online? Um, they can be made over the phone. Um, you have to call, so some parks can book certain parks. So like I said, Lake Louise, Kootenai, Yoho and Banff can all book each other's campsites. Um, Jasper can only do Jasper. And then um, regarding provincial parks, I'm not sure about Assiniboine. I did that one online. Regarding a GDT passport, is this something that could come about in a year or two, three to five years, five years? It's, a, it's an ongoing thing that the GDTA is working on. It's kind of one of the main topics we're discussing right now. I think we're firm believers that it would help the park. We think it would help hikers. It would kind of benefit everybody. Um, but as of right now, we don't really have a, a good update on that. And then Vanessa, did you feel 
safe to go solo. I didn't go solo. I was very much in the bubble. Um, do one of you guys want to speak to that? I answered it in the chat, but yes, I was solo twice. I felt totally safe. Would do it again solo. Um, Mark asked, is Sunshine Village closed this year? Um, as far as we know, it's going to be closed this year. Um, so yeah, you have to walk down that access road. I know in previous years, people have been able to get a ride down the, uh, the road to Banff, but um, as far as we know, Sunshine Village is going to be closed this year. Um, what do you do if you end up significantly behind or ahead of schedule? Um, it's pretty uncommon to get super ahead of schedule. Um, there's certain days I found, so like Eloise was saying, if you plan double zeros, sometimes you can just leave a day early and then kind of get the ball rolling. Um, if you're really behind, I know a couple people were in section A were pretty far behind and they were not, they needed a break day. Um, and they just went to the road and hitched to the next resupply spot. Um, certain sections are gonna be way easier to do that than others. Um, but in general, I think that's one of the biggest challenges of the GDT is kind of staying on pace. So really thinking critically about how much elevation gain I can do per day, how far can I go per day, and how many days in a row can I do that? Let's see. For a nine to 10 day food carry, um, what URSAC would you recommend? Great question. Um, I had, so I hiked it with my partner and we had, we each had the middle size. I can't remember the, the exact leaders, um, but there's three <laughs> sizes of Ursac. We each had the middle size and that was fine for every single section, except for the last section. Um, we had one of those little, um, the littlest Ursacs at home. So we shipped that in our resupply box for section F and G. So then we shared that it was just that little bump to get us up over that that 10 day section. So if you only want to buy one Ursac for the whole trail, maybe just get the biggest one. It will seem gigantic on some of your shorter sections, but um, if you're trying to save some bucks, I would just get the biggest one if you're going to be doing F and G in one push anyway. And then isn't Ursac needed or any hangable bag? Um, I would 100% say I think an Ursac is necessary. Um, there's a lot of sections where you'll be above tree line camping and there's nowhere to hang your bag. So you might just, so for section E, there's a couple spots where there's no trees where you camp. Um, section C, there's a few spots. If you take the North over Ridge alternate, there's no sections to hang your, your bag. So you're just gonna have to kind of bury it in rocks or do something. But um, the peace of mind, especially maybe on day four of an eight day stretch that your food is gonna be safe. Even if it gets not on, it might just get kind of munched up, but not eaten is a, it's definitely a safety thing. And I think um, everybody should use an Ursac. If you have a bear can, you can use that, but they're so heavy and bulky and they don't get smaller the more food you eat. <laughs> All right. Let's see. Considering tent pads, is it possible to use a non-freestanding tent? Yes, 100%. I used a non-freestanding tent. Um, probably about half the hikers out there are going to be using a non-freestanding tent. Um, there was only two sections where it was harder, but it was fully doable. It was hard, rocky ground. Um, but um, if you've never set it up before, maybe just go practice somewhere where it's kind of rocky. You just kind of have to get a little ingenuitive tying your, your, uh, your tent around rocks and stuff or burying a stake in rocks, but um, you can totally use a non-freestanding tent. Do we foresee the number of GDT through hikers increasing to the point where reservations or staggering start dates will be needed? Um, that's kind of already happening kind of organically. People kind of have been starting between June 15th, a late, which would be quite early. You'll have a lot of snow in section A. And then there's not too many people that start after like July 20th, because then you're gonna be coming into quite a bit of cold weather in September. Um, so I think just, due to the nature that parks reservation or to the parks reservations that people have staggered out of necessity almost. Um, like I said, we don't have a through hiker permit necessarily. 
So um, it's just kind of people have already gone that way just out of necessity. And how cold does it get at night in the Alpine? We were told minus five in mid July. I, it's not uncommon for it to be colder than minus five, um, especially when you add moisture and stuff. Like um, if you're by a creek or say it snows overnight, um, I think it's pretty common. My partner had the 10 degree enlightened equipment quilt, 10 degrees Fahrenheit. And I had a minus nine Celsius quilt. Um, I wasn't cold um, in either, I was never cold in that quilt. Um, she was not cold either. Um, but yeah, I do think that if you are used to hiking in Europe or the PCT, you might need to get a warmer quilt. Um, I know a lot of people get like zero degree bags for some hikes. Um, and that's really cutting it temperature wise. It's, it's certain that you're definitely going to have below freezing nights. So, I mean, most bags, when they say it's minus five, that's kind of like the limit. It's not necessarily comfort. And it's almost certain that you're going to have nights that are at least minus five. And it's nice to not necessarily be pushing the, the limit of the sleeping bag. And it's nice to stay within that comfort range. All righty. Yeah, if anybody has any other questions, feel free to speak up. Let's answer the what was your favorite part of the trail question. Okay. <laughs> Shall I go? Go for it. Um, G was the most rewarding. But if I had to pick a favorite section, it would be E for most kind of enjoyable. Um, I, th I think I would agree with E overall is my favorite section, especially um, Cataract Pass was just stunningly beautiful. Um, but my absolute favorite day was um, crossing the Alpine section right before Blueberry Lake. We had fantastic weather and it was just, it was incredible. Yeah, I love E as well. I've done E as a section hike. And then again, on the through hike this past year, um, I also love G the most too. It just, we didn't see any other hikers for 12 days, except for one time and they were going Sobo and just to, it's really remote. Like you're not, it's not on the way to anything. You're not close to anything. And it's just so much kind of raw beauty that it doesn't have that kind of the same it's not the rock wall trail or a Cinnabon. You're in a section of trail that's what I thought was the most beautiful section of the whole trail, but it doesn't have that kind of hype around it. So it felt super, super rewarding to kind of be out there. It felt like I knew a secret nobody else did. Um, quick question from Australia where it's uh, 30 degrees on Friday afternoon. Thanks for today. It's been absolutely invaluable and really inspiring. Um, just a pre thought you got on the trip from Calgary down to Waterton, the easiest way to tackle that. <laughs> Aussie, 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 spot on, Mark. If there are a couple um, shuttles that have been offered. Um, there's some info on that on the Great Divide Trail in particular, or the Great Divide Trail website. So if you go to trip planning resources and then access, um, there are a couple operators that will drive down there. Um, Mountain Man Mike is one of the people he drives from Calgary to Pincher Creek. And then from Pincher Creek, you can get a taxi. Um, I'll just give you the link to that site right now. It is right there. Um, it will cost you a few bucks, but in the grand scheme of things, it's kind of the way it goes. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Let's see, how many days of rain did we get overall? Um, this past year, I think I got really fortunate and I had three zeros and all my zeros it rained. So I was in town, um, but I think that, I mean, this was on record, like one of the driest years ever. And we got five or six days of rain. How, how about uh, you guys, Eloise and Charlene, how many rain days did you guys get? Um, I don't know off the top of my head. Uh, we didn't actually count. We had a lot north of Jasper though. Um, almost every day, I think. Um, wet feet for the two weeks it took us to do that straight. 
and then a couple of days too but I know people that have hiked and I'm sure Charlene can talk about it more in other years that have had a very different experience in terms of rain. Yeah, 2019, I think if you talk to a through hiker from 2019, it'd be very different. Uh, I don't know, I didn't count my rain days either. I didn't get any rain until in section D, but um, as Eloise said, um, it does get, uh, does get wetter north of Jasper in my experience. Was smoke a limiting factor for anybody's hike this year? Found it was worse than normal. Um, the nice thing with hiking is that you're moving. I found, so I live in Nelson, BC, and I've heard this summer the smoke just sat in the valley all summer long. But fortunately on the GDT, you're really traversing quite a bit of ground. Um, so it doesn't ever feel like you're necessarily stuck in the smoke for weeks on end. There were definitely some smoky days, like in section E, there were some smoky days. Um, it did kind of limit a bit of the view, but I found that it doesn't, at least this past summer, it didn't necessarily feel like we were trapped in the smoke all summer long because you're kind of moving and up in the mountains, there's wind, the smoke's moving too. So it's not necessarily just going to be with you the whole way through the trail. Let's see. Are any random camping permits needed for Michelle Lakes and Pinto Lake? I've seen different maps that place them in Banff, White Goat, and neither of those. So as far as I know, Michelle Lakes and Pinto are both in White Goat. Um, neither of those need a reservation. Um, once you come up and over Cataract Pass, um, you drop into the Brazo Loop. On Cataract Pass is a sign that says Jasper National Park. From there on out, um, there's no random camping allowed and you have to camp on the reservable sites, which is on the Brazo Loop in Jasper. Random camping permits for um, which section? For section A, so for section A, there are a couple. So when you arrive in Waterton, <clears throat> um, if you go to the parks office, you can make the reservations there. So I know Akamina is actually a provincial park, which is usually uh, a lot of people stay there. Heads up, it got burned a couple of years ago. So there's no shade at all. Um, so um, it's pretty hot. This past year, all of us hung out under the, the walking bridge for like six hours because it was the only shade. Um, and then a lot of people stay at Lone Lake or Twin Lakes. And for those, you will need a random camping permit that you can pick up in um, at the parks office in Waterton. Uh, what are the sketchiest river crossings to keep in mind? Um, F and G, there's quite a few. Um, Charlene can probably answer those better. I always forget the name of the rivers in particular, but I do remember that when we were going through in August, there were a couple that were up to my waist. I'm six feet tall and they were pretty swift. And this past year, a couple people got swept in the Howes River in section D. That could have been mitigated. I think there was some root finding challenges that they ran into. They tried to take an alternate that um, I think with hindsight, they wouldn't have taken. But Charlene, you want to go for the, the river crossings? Yeah, I mean, levels of rivers change. So, um, you know, quickly from day to day or season to season. So um, it, it, the, the most difficult ones are marked in, um, in the Far Out app. I think they all have like an exclamation point. <laughs> and there, yeah, there's the Smoky River, which is at the end of F. And then from there on out, there are, there are a bunch in G. Um, we also found Collie Creek quite difficult. That might have been partially the it's glacial, so it was a warm day when we did it, and it was a little bit later in the day. But for us, that was the worst one. Um, even the rivers that aren't marked on Far Out, just to expand on Charlene's comment a little bit. Um, if you read people's comments on the rivers, um, they will normally mention which ones are more challenging, and then also sometimes there's tips on the best place to cross too. And if river crossings are new to you, um, crossing in the morning, it's almost always going to be significantly shallower. Like if you go in the late afternoon on a hot day, 
the river can swell much like way over a foot. So if, um, crossing in the morning or even there were a couple where we spent at least 20 minutes kind of scoping out the best spot to cross. Like an extra 20 minutes of figuring it out is way better than getting wet, falling in the river, or like way worse. So definitely take your time around the river crossings. Um, are you aware of any services that one can hire to coordinate all the permits for a fee? I am not. Um, as far as I know, I don't know anybody that will do that. Um, if you are able to, I would definitely suggest taking at least half the day off, just kind of out of precaution um, to plan a two month trip and have everything booked off and plan to find out that you can't get your reservations because you got to run to work would be such a bummer. So if you can take at least the morning off, I would highly suggest that. For the BC campsite reservations are open first to people that live in BC. Um, I know that this past year that did happen. Um, mixed thoughts on that. Um, there's not that many BC parks that you're going to cross through. Um, Assiniboine would be the main one. The way that was enforced was by license plates or by driver's license. Um, let's just say that's easy to get around. You won't have a car. So yeah, unless anybody has any other questions, um, what sections of trails GDTA planning on building and maintaining in 2022? Um, quite a few sections, um, still kind of um, waiting to kind of get all these buttoned down completely. But um, again, in sections F and G, or I guess G through the Jack Pine, there's gonna be some finishing up there. Um, there's gonna be some sections through the Moline Valley that there's gonna be some maintenance on. Um, I particularly don't sit on the committee for trail maintenance. Um, trying to think of any other areas that would be getting some work. Um, yeah, I think those are the two main ones this year. Um, yeah, I'm sure we'll we'll be posting as soon as there are work uh, or trail building opportunities. If anybody's interested, um, feel free to check out the Great Divide Trail website. Shoot us an email. We'd love to have people come build trail with us. Where is this recording going to be posted? It's going to be on YouTube. I'll put the link in the Great Divide Trail um, hikers Facebook page just on a comment from this event um, or, you know it's probably easier I'll just make a new post I'll link it there if anybody has any extra questions or you come up with something later you can totally put it in the comments and I'll respond to it someone who's done six passes any advice to pass on um, yeah you're going to be going slow <laughs> I think um, especially compared to the other section e coming off Brazo loop it um, like 20k a day was plenty. Um, we stayed in the middle. So the six passes. So we stayed in between pass three and four, right in the middle there. I found that's probably the best spot to camp. There's a bit of a meadow there where it's flat. It's kind of spongy and wet, but um, we found a couple dry spots. Um, besides that, the uh, just kind of as a bit of info, the gut hooks are, I think it's called far out now. That track is a suggestion, not necessarily the right, the way to go. Um, there's only one party a day that's allowed through that area. So there's really no evidence of hikers. There's no kind of, there's not even grass necessarily that's been flattened down from people walking through. So if you are going to do that, just make sure that it's to do it in a day would be superhuman. Like that would be a, a huge amount, especially um, in the middle of the section there. So definitely plan on spending a night on the, on the six pass. Um, I was late to join blah, 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 about gear. Um, we are going, so this is part one of a three-part webinar series. Um, two weeks from today, we're going to have one on food prep and food safety. Um, for people that have done a ton of through hikes, um, it might not necessarily be um, particularly helpful if you already have everything dialed down. But if you are 
um, new to maybe dehydrating your own food, or if you are new to through hiking and need some tips and hints on how to kind of plan out a meal prep plan for a whole through hike, how to make your own food. Um, my partner and I, we made almost all our own food for the whole trail. Um, we'd never done that before. And I think we probably saved hundreds, if not thousands of dollars doing so. And it was super nice because we got to eat what we wanted. Um, and then two weeks after that, we're going to have one specifically on gear. We have one on gear last year and it was a huge hit, huge hit. Um, kind of what we had set up last year was, um, so Charlene was on there and we, there were three people that kind of talked about three different styles of backpacking. Um, one like ultra lighter, so sub 10 pound base weight, um, somebody in kind of that 10 to 15 pound base weight, and then somebody with more of a traditional backpacking setup with like a 20 pound base weight. Um, that'll be in a month from today. Um, again, same time. And we'll kind of dive deep into the gear recommendations for their kind of what works, what we found doesn't necessarily work on the GDT, maybe in comparison to other trails. And, um, yeah, we wanted to get that one in early. Cause I know a lot of people are going to be ordering their gear. And I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of holdups on that stuff right now. What was our go-to navigation device? Um, so yeah, gut hooks, um, pretty much everybody across the board has gut hooks or far out. It's going to be hard for me to break that habit. Um, also, phone with inReach Mini. Yeah, I think pretty much everybody I know had an inReach as well. I found the navigation on the inReach to not be very good. Um, it can be kind of frustrating. It's not as seamless as gut hooks, especially when you can hit a point and be like, okay, we have a thousand meters to go with 12K to our campsite. So, 100% uh, recommend getting gut hooks, inReach Mini, and think even just to send in, send those check-in um, messages every night to somebody or just to get a weather update to see, okay, is, are we gonna be in the rain for the next three days or can we push really hard and get into town? Um, I highly suggest getting an inReach as well. Um, love to see the sunrise. How dangerous is it to hike at twilight? Any sunrise views you recommend I don't miss? I think it's pretty common for most through hikers to see sunrise almost every day. Um, I know in section A, we were hiking at three in the morning and sunrise was at like five. So we were hiking with headlamps in the morning. It was super hot and then pretty common to be hiking into the evening. Fortunately on, in the Rockies, it's light till 10 or 11 o'clock at night. So you really gotta be hiking pretty late to have to use a headlamp at night, but it's pretty common to hike early in the morning before the heat gets you, especially if you have big days. And then any epic spots like coming up over Numa Pass at sunset is incredible. Um, we did La Coulette. At, we saw a sunrise from La Coulette Peak. That was super cool too. Um, I don't know. Any of those high alpine passes at sunrise are just spectacular. For Barnaby Ridge, stay at Grizzly Lake or hike La Coulette Barnaby in a day to stay at South Fork. Um, Everybody I know that's ever done Barnaby always stays at Grizzly Lake. So it might add a day to your um, itinerary, but it's so far without water. Um, and that if you don't go to Grizzly Lake, there's still no water access. Going down to Grizzly too, you lose a few hundred meters of elevation gain. And I think after that massive day of going over all those and then continuing to keep going up and over peaks on Barnaby Ridge, most people are calling it quits at uh, Grizzly Lake and then just kind of hanging out in the shade and getting some water. see what permits are needed for fishing throughout the trail i do not know does anybody else have an answer to that one yeah sorry i can't help you there i think um i do know I think there's a, oh go ahead i think there's a federal uh, fishing permit required for national parks What's the longest we'd gone without a water source? Like there's water every day. There was never a section where I had to spend the night without water. Either of you guys have to spend the night without water. I think that all the campgrounds I came across had great water access. 
Um, yeah, we never had to camp without water. I would just like to reiterate your comments earlier about La Culato. Um, there are no water sources up there, and that was a long way to go, um, just in terms of difficult terrain without water, um, especially in the heat. So that was the only place we were really worried about water, I think. For me, it was like a I think there was like an eight or nine hour section without water rather than a, rather than days, measure more in hours, but those were all hard hours. So I, like I bought an extra water bottle for that section and I went through all three liters. All righty, if nobody has any other questions, there's just one three question survey if people wouldn't mind answering. It gives everybody here at the GDTA some insight as to um, what your plans are for the Great Divide Trail, um, what your previous experience is, and then we'd love any kind of feedback in that last box. It should only take one minute at the most if you click there. Um, it'd be super appreciated. Um, thanks everybody for coming out. It's awesome. I'm happy that this many people are interested in the Great Divide Trail. It's awesome to see how fast it's growing. And uh, yeah, appreciate everybody that's here um, wanting to hike the trail. And then again, just uh, I feel like I have to mention it just because the uh, we are a volunteer run organization that runs mostly on donations. I'm just gonna put one last link. If anybody is interested in becoming a member, you can do, you can be on our trail building trips. Um, you can sit in on some of the committees. So this was organized by the outreach committee. We have several committees, one for trail advocacy. Um, there's some on organiz organizational excellence. Any way at all that you wanna be involved with the GDTA, there's probably a position for you and we'd love to have you. Um, and none of us make any money from this and all the money goes straight back into the trail. So again, thanks everybody. And uh, if you have any further questions, uh, feel free to just post them on that Facebook group or um, yeah, this sh there should, uh, this will be up on the YouTube channel probably tomorrow or Saturday. Alrighty, take care everyone, good night. Thank you so much.